why, why are we talking about this? And kind of the, the reason is, you know, there is a lot of noise in the industry today. You know, if you go into your favorite browser, you do a search for BizTalk or something else, and there's a good chance you have a bunch of ads showing up. It might be some farm animals following you around, but it's, uh, there's a variety of competitive competitors out there all looking to be your integration platform. And part of the, the challenge with that is that there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of buzz, but people are moving away from looking at requirements when selecting an integration platform. So we wanted to do a bit of a level set around that and you know, get back to basics and actually focus on requirements instead of focusing on some of the flashier things that are going on in the, in the industry. Again, without a doubt, some disruptive technologies are introducing new requirements in this space. Certainly things like mobility, SaaS, uh, Internet of Things, cloud. And you know, that is forcing platforms to change. Now some vendors have gone out and attacked that and really gone after some of these newer technologies and built their platforms around it. Others have been more kind of the traditional integration platform, running on-premise, large customer bases, and there's a paradigm shift that is occurring. And I think this week has been a perfect example of that. So what we wanted to do is to develop some awareness. And I say we, uh, the reason for that is, um, you know, within this talk, we'll, ta we'll announce that there's a white paper that's been created uh, to support some of this presentation. And it was done by Michael Stevenson and Steph Jan Wiggers and myself. And what we've done is come up with a approximately 40 page document around some of the requirements that we feel are important when looking at an integration platform. Uh, we subsequently created a spreadsheet where you know, we've gone ahead and ranked Microsoft and their stack. So kind of the, the reason for this or the opportunity is for those of you who may be in consulting or you might be Microsoft partners or even independent consultants, you're constantly running up into compete scenarios with these other vendors. And one thing that's easy to get lost in is some of this buzzword. So this is an opportunity for you to work with your customers and say, hey, let's, let's like level set, let's take a step back. Let's go ahead and look at this from a requirements based perspective, much like any other project, and actually make sure that the platform that you're gonna choose is gonna address your needs. And then on the flip side, if you're a customer, and you know, chances are you've got integration today, at some point you're gonna need an upgrade. You're gonna need to make a choice. Do you stay down the same path or do you look at some of the alternatives? So from a customer perspective, you can use this as well as a bit of a scorecard and actually manage the conversation with the various vendors and partners out there to ensure that you guys are looking at this objectively and not looking at this because one company is doing more in social media or not. So here's uh, my interpretation of a, a certain magic quadrant out there. Now, don't get too hung up into where things are positioned, but here are the integration companies that you will see very prominently within the industry today. So you've got some of your traditional companies in there, your IBMs, your Kibcos, your SAPs. You've got some of the more SaaS-based integration platforms, things like Dell Boomi and SnapLogic. You've got some of the open source players like MuleSoft and Red Hat. And then we also have Microsoft as well. So all of these companies have come from, from different heritages and it can be confusing when selecting a platform. So what we wanted to do is actually walk through some of the different scenarios and actually talk about requirements so that when people need to make a decision, they can do that based upon good info. So in terms of the agenda for today, I'm gonna to take a look at 10 different requirements. Now, these don't, I initially had top 10 and I removed that because you know, this is very subjective. My top 10 might be different from yours. If you're into B2B and EDI and I'm not, obviously you're gonna put more emphasis on that. So I think these are 10 fairly universal requirements that anybody can use uh, when looking at this stuff. Um, also have a, a legacy modernization demo where I'm gonna actually take a look at you know, the BizTalk or so the Microsoft stack and how we can address kind of a common theme that we are seeing within the industry. Uh, the announcement, I've kind of uh, given that away already, but I will have a, a link to the document where you can actually pick it up from. 
And certainly there will be some, some time for questions. So tools. So I've got some of the tools listed here. It isn't necessarily an exhaustive list. And, and some of this stuff I don't, I ex fully expect you're quite aware of all of these things and how they work in BizTalk. And that's not the point. The point is that some of these tools will differ. Mileage will vary based on the platform. So even though this might seem like common sense a lot of the time, you may, your experience may differ in some of these other platforms. So it is important to consider them going forward. So in terms of an IDE, you know, I think polish is, you know, is very important, right? Like you want a, something that is clean, that is free of bugs, that's very responsive. If you drag a widget onto the canvas, it should land where you left it. You shouldn't have to squint and zoom in and look exactly for that one pixel when dragging a component back and forth. Another thing is property exposure. Now, what I mean by this is that if I want to configure my workflow or configure a widget on my workflow, I want to do that from one place. I don't want to partially configure it in one area and then have to switch to some sort of file, maybe it's an XML file, because not all the properties are exposed. I don't want to be flipping back and forth. We've, we buy integration platforms to be more productive, not less productive. An administration console, and I use the term console loosely, that can come in a variety of different flavors. But you know, from a, an administration standpoint, I want visibility into my in-flight and suspended messages. And I don't want to build that myself. You know, I don't want to say, oh, I've got a, a failure here. I need to build my own sus suspend queue. And then I need to retry that message later, so I need a retry queue. And then I need tooling on top of that in order to resume. You know, these are things that should be out of the box, not something left for you to implement. Another thing is modifying configuration. I don't want to redeploy an application if I have to change a password because someone has gone ahead and modified based upon some policy, right? You should have the ability to configure URIs and configure security credentials as required without a redeployment. Uh, data mappers is another fundamental tool of productivity. So I want large message support. Not everything is going to be two bytes or you know, 2K or 10K. Occasionally, we're going to have some larger messages. When I'm going to be doing some transformation, I want some extensibility. You know, a lot of demos out there, it looks great. You have just straight lines going across. But as you all know, in the real world, there's more challenging maps out there. So I want the ability to either call out to some managed code. I want the ability to use some XSLT. And that may not be your first choice. Maybe it is for some people. But it's good to have a fallback. So even recently, I was working with some of my colleagues on integrating with AX. And we needed to do a journal posting and move you know, from a hierarchy into you know, more of a flattened structure. And we needed to populate some dimensions. And it didn't necessarily lend itself to the traditional BizTalk map. So you know, dig out XSLT, not overly difficult, and problem solved. And the other thing is complex mapping. You know, this is one of the things, if you're evaluating a platform, is to give some people some complex scenarios. Make them map it. Show it to them. Make sure it performs. Make sure there's no memory leaks. And ensure that you know, it can handle this, because this is one of the reasons why you are buying a platform. So pub, sub. This is another thing where you know, my expectations is that there's going to be some of these capabilities out of the box. Now, it's not necessarily going to solve everything you know, in terms of maybe topics and subscriptions and some of those things. But there should be some level of pub sub out of the box. You know, don't sell me an integration platform and then say, oh, you want to do pub sub? Go buy another messaging engine. You know, I, I don't think that's the right answer. I think in some complex scenarios, you may need to do that. But there should be some level out of the box. Uh, loose, loose coupling, you know, this, is a very, this is not a new requirement or a new principle that you're hearing. But for some platforms, you need to you know, add another lane inside of a workflow in order to actually add a subscriber. You know, if I've got a set of integrations or interfaces published, I want to attach a subscriber. I don't want to touch those other ones. I don't want to redeploy. You know, I shouldn't have to. And so that would be another tenant that would be important to me. Uh, the next one is around durable messaging. And you know, for me, this is a pretty big one. And I'm sure you know, you've all gone through some complex scenarios. And maybe there are some scenarios where it's OK to lose a message. But I haven't run into too many of those. You know, so 
you know, in some of the situations, like a million dollar work order, I can't lose that. You know, I'm not buying a platform to, to lose that message. Um, I used to work with Luciano uh, back to Portis, Alberta, and we were never allowed to lose a message for, you know, turning a person's uh, power on or off. You know, if there's an SLA in place, you know, 24 hours, that power needs to be restored. We click the button in SAP. We expect that that message is not going to get lost. It may fail, but we will know about it. But it's not just going to vanish. Another thing is a construction quote. You know, in the energy industry, if you're building infrastructure, it's a highly competitive process. You know, the business is not going to say, oh, oh, you lost that one. We'll go get the next one. You know, so durable messaging is, continues to be extremely important in my mind. And so I was encouraged to hear in the, the BPM session earlier where, you know, Microsoft is focusing on lightweight integration, which is absolutely critical, but they're not willing to concede or give up some of the traditional enterprise requirements, which is perfect. Exception management. And yes, my expectations are a little bit better than this. But... Um, the point is, is once again, some platforms are looking for you to build a lot of this. I don't want to build a lot of this. Don't make me build my own. You know, what, we, we buy platforms to accelerate development, to return value to the business, and, you know, I don't want to have to take care of this. You know, yeah, I should have to capture exceptions and understand where things fail, but I want some place where I can publish this. And, you know, we're integration-focused people. We're always busy. And had an example at a previous company where we were using the exception portal, the ESP exception portal, and you know, the, we were in kind of project mode and we were integrating a commercial off the shelf system. And the QA person felt bad coming to me saying, well, you know, did this go through? Uh, was there any errors? And it was kind of like, well, I didn't mind doing it. It's kind of part of the role, but it was also not the most efficient process because I was busy as well. So I'm like, you know what? All of these events are being published to the exception portal We'll create a subscription for you. Go ahead and take a look. And uh, if you need further assistance, let me know. Because it wasn't that the BizTalk interfaces were failing. It was that some of the issue was in the downstream system. And it was returning errors. And she wanted to validate whether or not they had fixed, uh, fixed those issues. So you know, these self-service requirements go beyond just project mode, but obviously into uh, you know, post-go live. So we have situations where. You may have a business SME that needs to understand when, say, some master data is out of date. We had a, a previous, it was actually at Fortis as well, where we, um, we had to rely upon WBS elements as part of the construction quoting process. That was master data in SAP. We had no control over it. You know, when that, if that became stale, there was nothing we could do from a BizTalk perspective that was more of a business function. So we set them up so that they could be, uh, you know, subscribed to business-related exceptions and they could address the issue. Technical issues, those belong to us. We need to deal with them. So application isolation. So everyone's talking about multi-tenancy for, for good reason. It's, it saves money. It's co-hosting. But everyone loves it until it breaks you know, or until your app goes down because someone is consuming too many resources and you're now starved, right? But it doesn't mean that you should go and say, oh, I only want my own one VM for one BizTalk application. That's not practical. That's not realistic. It doesn't scale. But you do want some sort of protection mechanisms to prevent those issues from occurring. Same thing with application deployments. If, if someone goes and deploys their app, you know, they shouldn't have to worry about me coming in and doing something crazy and taking theirs down. You know, we do need some sort of kind of built-in isolation, um, you know, within the platform. And, you know, hate to pick on Luciano, but we learned this the hard way a few years ago uh, prior to BizTalk having kind of that host throttling settings um, within the platform. And we had business user who went ahead and released a bunch of IDOCs, way more than they were supposed to. It was an accident. And each one of these iDocs went and called six different services. It was actually in the meter. <laughs> uh, not turning people's power off, but uh, the idea was that all of a sudden we had this proliferation of service calls being made and biz talks grinding to a halt. Meanwhile, we have the field guys in a completely different business department going, what's going on? We're not receiving our work orders. So, you know, it was certainly a le lesson learned for us several years ago about why this is important 
And I don't think this changes regardless of whether you're doing you know, integration platform as a service, whether it's IaaS or whether it's on-prem. And the last thing I'll say is on uh, application isolation is, you know, API management throttling is great, but it's not a universal solution. So it wouldn't have helped us in the SAP situation. It's fantastic if you've got, say, mobile devices or, you know, you're exposing your APIs externally and you've got third parties. It's, it's great. But not all integration goes through an API management environment at this point. You know, down the road, we'll probably see more of it. But in situations where you're dealing with on-prem and SAP and other lines of business systems, it's just not practical yet. So analytics. We've heard a little bit about this this week. And I think this is becoming more and more important. And I would say at this point, we almost have two flavors of analytics. We have your you know, traditional on-premise enterprise bus or broker, whatever you want to call it, your, your BAM, what we would call BAM today. And you know, I would say, in my experience anyways, that organizations are becoming more data-driven. They are making less decisions based upon hunches and more based upon data. And when your middleware platform is your heart of your organization, where you've got most of your traffic flowing through it, it provides a great place to actually capture it and actually display it for them. And it was funny where, you know, early on, I kind of jumped on the, the BAM bandwagon and we built a solution upon it. And it provided some good business results. And then all of a sudden, you know, kind of went quiet and not sure where it's going. It hadn't been innovated. It hadn't been updated. And it was kind of like, yeah, it didn't, wasn't really worth the, the additional hassle to implement it. But I would say more recently, you know, through my experience with, you know, both BizTalk and other platforms, is I've actually come to miss BAM because it is very powerful in the sense that we can configure milestones and create durations and do a lot of this stuff out of the box without having to custom develop a lot of things. So, you know, even on the project we're on right now with AX is we're going to expose BAM for our users as they're submitting invoices. Now they can see the, the status of their invoices as they're coming in. We've got a lot of different uh, business units involved and we're able to give this visibility at a central location. Now the next area of analytics is really API analytics. And I think this is extremely important going forward. If you do not have this in your platform or if it's not good, you're done. And the reason for it is that, you know, we've heard a little bit about the API economy you know, this past week. And really what that is, is it's monetizing your digital assets. So if you, it's more about business than it is about technology, really. So if I'm going to go ahead and expose APIs, and maybe I'm charging people for them, I need to know how many people are calling it. I need to know who is calling it, number one, so I can bill them. But also, if I'm in the business, I want to understand what is the rationalization of this investment. Is this actually good for the business? Have we kind of recouped the ROI that we expected to, how are you going to derive that without an API platform? So I really feel that it directs future investment. And you know, if you don't have a strong analytics platform, you're done. So deployment model. So ensure cloud is really cloud. If I can't self-service provision, if I can't auto scale, if I can't pay for what I use first when I want to without talking or without having to talk to a salesperson, like that is not cloud. So, you know, one of the, the benefits of Azure that I see is that, you know, it is self-service provisioning. We talked a little bit about microservices and how we will be able to auto burst. We will be able to auto scale. And we have full control over that through the Windows Azure portal. If you're running into these other platforms and you have to make a call, in order to ramp up for Black Friday or for Christmas, you know, just hang up the phone and talk to someone else. Another thing is around hybrid. You know, what options do you have? So Michael in his previous presentation outlined the Azure capabilities when it comes to networking. And, you know, I think the biggest thing is people are going to have different levels of comfort within the organization. So you just want to make sure the vendor has some flexible options that aligns to your enterprise architecture. That could be site-to-site -site VPN, it might be through relay services, it could be through a virtual cloud PC. It really becomes an organizational decision. And lastly on the on, on deployment models is on-premise. 
I think it is important to think about feature parity. You know, if you're building something on-prem, can you easily deploy that to the cloud? Do you have to make code changes? And, you know, lift and shift. And I think the, the story around this, it seems, sounds good so far with the microservices in the sense that, you know, deploy to the cloud, then bring it back on-prem through Azure Pack. And I think that is kind of the utopia when you talk about developing once, choose where you want to deploy it, and then move as required. I think that's going to be critical moving forward. So adapters. So the first one I want to talk about is, is LOB adapters. And, you know, things to look out for is, is it full featured? You know, we've seen a lot of websites, every vendor out there has all of their adapters on for display. And you want to ensure that, hey, that's the one I'm looking for. You know, you check the box. But make sure it is fully featured. Make sure it has either all of the operations or at least the operations you're interested in. Um, you know, you want to make sure that it's up to date with the vendor. And, you know, as SAP, you know, releases a new version of, of their stack, you want to make sure that you've got support. Same thing with AX and same thing with SharePoint. Don't underestimate that. Understand what some of the prerequisites are. These can come in the form of a library, can also come in the form of maybe a lightweight API service. What does that look like? How does it function? Is that going to cause, cause some disruption within your environment? And then moving on to SaaS connectivity. And this is uh, sometimes an interesting debate with uh, some of my colleagues and friends. But you know, the big question is, well, I've got a REST endpoint, so that SaaS provider has a REST endpoint. I can just use the REST adapter. Is that enough? And, and in my opinion, no, it's not. And you know, I think part of the reason is you know, we've talked about productivity. And um, you know, a great example that I ran into over a year ago was I had a shadow IT department that went out and procured some software services. And they were running their platform on Amazon. And they were using S3 and their queuing system for getting some of the data in and out. And then all of a sudden, they had to kind of come out from the shadows and say, oh, we actually need some corporate data. Can you help us out? So OK, I did some initial discovery and found out that, yeah, OK, yeah, there's a, a rest, uh, RESTful API that I can consume. But then I had to spend the next six hours banging my head on a desk trying to figure out the security mechanisms that Amazon wanted me to use in order to connect to it. So you know. Having that out of the box where I'm configuring username, password, and my secret token is a much better experience. And I could have spent that other five hours and 45 minutes solving a business problem instead of solving a, a plumbing or a technical problem. So I do feel that you know, SaaS connectivity is, is really important. And I think that what I've seen today uh, or this past week is, uh, is very encouraging in terms of the, the microservices and the ecosystem that Microsoft is trying to build. You know, and I think um, you know, if you're going to be building custom adapters, the vendor should be providing you good samples, documentation, testing, and some, like, you know, some examples that you can use and modify. I'm going to talk a little bit about marketplace in a bit, but I think this is a, a concept that will be more and more adopted by, um, by other platforms. And I think that's, it's going to be critical as well. Uh, when choosing a platform going forward. So community. Community is the heartbeat of an ecosystem. And I think uh, this week has been a pretty good example of, of Microsoft's ecosystem and how strong it is. And the people that make up the community are the ISVs, like the ones sitting over here on the left, and the related partners that are you know, providing services. We also have a host of contributors, whether they're bloggers or forum participants, insiders, influencers, that all make up to a vibrant community. And, and the benefits for you, know, you as the customer are implementation help. There's nothing worse than buying a platform and finding out that you're going to have some trouble getting some resources you know, to help you implement it. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer support, we've seen that this week. A lot of people talking to one another. This is how we solve this problem. How did you deal with this? You know, otherwise, you can feel like you're on an island without a good community. Another area is tools and best practices. And I do think you know, Microsoft's in a very, very good place with this. If you look at things like the BizTalk adapter, uh, or sorry, the BizTalk deployment framework, 
and biz units and some of the other pipeline testing tools. Uh, Nino with NOS, like these are all you know, significant contributions by the community and help adoption and help people be successful, which is what every vendor wants to, be, to do. So API management, talked a little bit about this before, but I really feel that it is a foundational component. It's, it's gonna enable the API economy, which I talked about. It's also gonna give you some governance so you understand who is consuming your service. Are they allowed to? So how, how frequently are they allowed to call it? Uh, it's gonna give you the ability to virtualize your services and modernize some of your legacy investments. You know, we all know mobile doesn't talk well with SOAP. It wants to talk REST, it wants to talk JSON. It's not practical to take your existing environment and convert everything to REST and JSON. It's just not gonna happen. So API management can help out with that. Caching is important, especially when you talk about, you know, scaling out and supporting a lot of volume. So in this case, when we have people that are, you know, browsing for a particular item, how much does this thing cost? Is the Microsoft band in place yet, right? Like you're constantly hitting and, you know, fetching the same set of data. So why don't you cache some of that, provide a better experience to your users, and reduce the amount of round trips to all of your back-end systems? Uh, developer engagement is uh, another area of opportunity. And what this means is, you know, you, you build this API, you know, the, you build it and they will come. It's sort of that mentality, but it doesn't necessarily work that well if you don't provide a good experience. So a couple weeks ago, I was looking at Azure API management and I wanted to consume another API. I was looking at two options. One was poorly documented, hardly any samples. One was very well documented and had great samples. Which one did I choose? Obviously the good one, the one with less friction. So providing that experience through tooling is, is gonna be key as well. And once you've done, gone ahead and done that, you're also able to do some code generation and scaffolding. So if I go ahead and define my RESTful API, and then I can actually use that to create workflows, you know, and basically you know, uh, scaffold that out, mock it out, and then have a good mocking service, it goes a long way into pr productivity as well. So we, um, as part of the MVP program, we had some insight into microservices about a month ago. So after being here for Summit, you know, I started thinking more about this and decided, you know, I should include something on this. And I think what I've seen this week has just really validated some of those thoughts. But I really do see that, you know, lightweight integration is coming. You know, I, I agree we're still gonna have those B2B, those EDI, you know, some of those traditional use cases, but more and more we're seeing lightweight integration. It was a bit eye-opening for me. I just completed my master's degree from Arizona State, and we had a, a business process modeling class as part of it. And this is through the business school, so not a lot of techies. And we were, um, had an assignment that involved using uh, if this, then that. Very simple drag and drop lightweight integration tool. And uh, then people were talking about how they've used it maybe in other use cases. And here's somebody in my class, she's not technical at all, and she was really into fantasy football. So fantasy football for the non-North Americans is you watch these American football players, you basically draft them, they're on your, your team, you play against other people in your league, if they do well, you get points, it becomes a bit of a competitive bragging rights sort of a thing. And what she had done was she had used this tool to actually subscribe to the waiver wire. So as players get released from other teams, she was subscribing to her feed from Yahoo Fantasy Football. She was then creating an email alert to herself where she could go look at it, and then she had a decision of whether or not she wanted to try to pick up that player through this workflow. So at first, me being a biz talk guy, I was thinking, oh yeah, no, you know, we've seen this before, it doesn't work. And then all of a sudden, we had an assignment to go through this, and I'm like, wow, like this is eye-opening, and we've got an end user going ahead and doing some of this integration by consuming other APIs without having to write a line of code. So, you know, obviously, you know, we always get a little bit suspicious when that's the case, but 
you know, there are some real world examples of, you know, how this is possible. And I think even what we saw, some of the demos this past week, you know, there wasn't a lot of coding there. And I think that is the future. And I think microservices will enable a lot of that. I think the, the large monolithic systems are going to slowly disappear in favor of these more lightweight capabilities. And, and once again, I think, the, you know, from a Microsoft perspective, what I would encourage them is, you know, don't lose sight of your, your history and what you really excel at now. If you can give us a lightweight platform, but still ensure we've got, you know, good control over pub sub and message durability, you know, we're going to be in a really good position. I think microservices will also introduce some new capabilities, um, especially on the Microsoft platform when it comes to SaaS connectivity. We've already seen that slide with a whole bunch of different um, SaaS connectors, whether it's Workday, Salesforce, uh, NetSuite, things of that nature. Uh, marketplace, I think, is going to be a big enabler. And I think it's an, hugely important. I think it also speaks to the community side of things as well. So we have a company like um, a Codet or a BizTalk360 who's out there publishing a, a, a microservice. Me being familiar with them, I'm going to feel comfortable that that's actually a good piece of software. So, you know, if, if Microsoft can come up with a, you know, a good testing and QA formula so that, you know, I'm confident and now we've got reputation involved, you know, I think this can really work. And the other thing is it allows us to do is service composition, but at a new level. And that's really, I need a rules microservice. I need SaaS connectivity microservice. Drag and drop these in, pull them up, make it easy for us to wire them together. And I think that the, the BizTalk microservices has a lot of legs. So some other considerations. I know I said there was 10, but uh, there was a few other thought points that were worth mentioning. Uh, one would be roadmap. And I think in the past, Microsoft was criticized for some of their visibility in terms of their roadmap. I think we can all confidently say that that has changed. You know, Microsoft's here sharing their roadmap, sharing their vision, looking for feedback. I think times have definitely changed. You know, is a roadmap up to date? You know, who cares if, you know, someone's roadmap was from three years ago? But it would be interesting to see, you know, were they able to execute on that? Another one which you've probably seen in the industry is single vendor versus best of breed. And this is one kind of I struggle with a little bit. But, you know, I think you want to take into consideration your enterprise architecture alignment. You know, if you are a single vendor shop traditionally and you try to bring in best of breed or some of these open source platforms, you're probably going to run into some challenges. However, if that's if you're comfortable in that mode, that might work for you. But I think it's also very important to look at vendor motivation behind their open source investments or their best of breed investments. Are they selectively choosing components to open source and then sell you the, the more enterprise features? I think that's something you really need to understand with choosing someone and don't choose them because, oh, they're open source. Well, what does that really mean? Another area is monitoring. So how will you monitor your platform after you've gone live? Can you do that from a single tool? Is it comprehensive? Is it going to give you the visibility that you need? And I think that's something you can't discount either. So we're going to do a bit of a demo. And the, the theme around it is legacy modernization. And it comes from uh, an insurance use case where you've got someone who's interested in getting a car or auto quote. So, you know, historically, insurance companies, on-premise systems, typically low risk. You know, in the past, they've had a lot of agents. You call them, you give them your information, they'll look it up. Obviously, the trend, the industry is moving more towards customer self-service, and as a result, mobility. So, you know, today, with the existing Microsoft platform, you know, how would you solve some of these problems? And how do you start, you know, delivering some of these new capabilities to your business? And I think, you know, the microservices looks great, and this picture would look different with it. But, you know, today as it stands, we still have some ability to modernize existing legacy investments. So on the right-hand side screen here, we've got your traditional business applications, so your policy systems, your customer information system, a rating or your quote engine. Uh, you might have a Department of Motor Vehicles service. 
which uh, is going to contain information, classifications of vehicles, etc. These are systems that likely communicate using SOAP, and obviously BizTalk supported SOAP for a decade or so, if not longer. But now we've got you know, these mobile devices, and they don't want to talk SOAP, they want to talk JSON. How are we going to solve this problem? Well, one way of doing that with BizTalk Server 2013 R2 is taking advantage of some of the new JSON capabilities, so now we can both uh, accept and, and publish JSON messages. And you know, we can also leverage an API management solution. So I haven't implemented that portion for this because it's just a demo, but the idea is I want to expose this. I want to understand who is actually communicating or connecting to my services. I want to understand, you know, is this worth the money or did we just, you know, get caught up in a, you know, a me too sort of scenario and just following the leader. And I also want to have some, um, you know, analytics and governance around this. So, you know, I think this is a, a pretty compelling story and I think it's a, you know, one where we can do some things for the business now instead of waiting for, for another platform. So I have a Windows Store app here and it's simply my auto insurance app. So I'm going to log in as a customer wanting to get a new quote for an automobile that I'm looking at. So the first thing I can do is go ahead and take a look at my personal information. And this is going to be surfaced through the customer information uh, system via BizTalk. So this is a JSON message that's being sent out. BizTalk is going to go ahead and call the SOAP services. The next situation is um, my current policy. So I currently driving this big gas guzzling SUV. I've kind of you know woken up. I have a conscious now. I want to get something a little bit more environmentally friendly. So I'm going to go ahead and see how much a quote would cost based upon my existing rating factors. So the state I live in, which fictitiously here is Washington, my age, which is also fictitiously represented here, and take into account you know, whether or not a, a vehicle is considered environmentally friendly by the Department of Motor Vehicles, and actually come up with a cost. So I've gone ahead and sold all of my Bitcoin and I've decided that I'm interested in you know, looking at one of these new BMWs. And I go ahead and get a quote and find out, okay, well, it's, it actually happens to be a little bit cheaper, fictitiously, because you know, this is, it's more environmentally friendly. So I'm going to go ahead and purchase this. And we see that it's been successfully updated. And if I go back to my current policy, we'll see that you know, the BMW is now part of my profile. So here's a, a situation kind of like along the lines of what Michael said is a few years ago, this is probably pretty difficult to do you know, because we had some of these constraints and now you know, leveraging the Microsoft stack, we can actually modernize some of these existing assets because assets, it's just not practical to expect that you're going to be able to upgrade and, and um, modernize everything within your environment, but taking advantage of an agile integration platform will allow you to do that. So I'm curious, as I mentioned before, you know, this was my perspective, this was kind of 10 or so that I had to choose, but is there anything that you think I've missed? Is there any kind of burning requirements that it would be must have for you if you were going to be you know, buying or upgrading an integration platform? Licensing, so we said, yeah. So um, absolutely, we, we have a section on that in the, in the white paper as well, but I would agree. Licensing is, is absolutely important. Anything else? So one of the things that um, we didn't get a chance to, to get into, but I think is also important, is kind of the Internet of Things. We all know that that's coming. Uh, we, I, in my opinion, I think things are converging. Right? We've got traditional integration. We've got now SaaS connectivity. We're going to have Internet of Things. Maybe it's industrial devices. 
we then are likely going to want to subscribe to some of those events for our on-premise systems. And then we're going to want some analytics on that so that we can basically improve the performance of our business based upon this real-time data. So I, I do really think that the convergence of big data with IoT, with SaaS connectivity, and your traditional integration is really kind of the, the big problem that we as integration folks are going to have to solve in the next couple years and obviously moving forward. So in terms of the announcement here is the link for the white paper. Uh, it's free of charge. It's uh, hosted on BizTalk 360's site. I want to call out uh, Michael Stevenson and Steph Jan for their contributions. Um, you know, they're in Europe. I'm in North America. It was kind of interesting to kind of see some of the, the scenarios they run into in their region of the world versus mine. And uh, we actually had some some good arguments uh, around some of the rankings when we went ahead and ranked uh, the Microsoft stuff. So, so that was interesting and, and fun as well. Uh, but feel free to, to check that out. And also interested in feedback. So um, we're already talking about having a 1.1 version of this as the microservices stuff evolves. Because I do think that will kind of allow Microsoft to check off some of the boxes that would have been tougher to check at uh, the current time.